Hi, welcome to Room Now. We have the pleasure of Michelle Petrie with us, and we're going to talk about some of the things she's presenting at this meeting. Michelle, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jack. Okay. So for the audience, I'm going to have them get out their pens and, and paper and write down the abstract numbers of 1261, 1262, and 1266. We're going to talk about the issue of testing for antiphospholipid syndrome and some of its predictive value um, uh, in predicting future thromboses. Um, and let's just start with 1261. You talked about the profile of what you do in your clinic of over 800 patients in the Hopkins lupus clinic. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, Jack, the problem is lupus is not like primary antiphospholipid syndrome. So for primary antiphospholipid syndrome, people have memorized this thing, triple positivity. If you have lupus anticoagulant and anticardilipin and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1, then you're at high risk. Well, it turns out that doesn't hold true in lupus, where the majority of the thrombotic risk is actually explained by the lupus anticoagulant. And what's really important for everyone to know is that the lupus anticoagulant fluctuates in lupus the same way anti-DNA might fluctuate, for example, or low complement. And so it is necessary to look for the lupus anticoagulant probably multiple times, because if a patient has it, even 25% of their visits, they have an increased risk of thrombosis. And you, um, in your studies, looking at how predictive lupus anticoagulant is versus um, uh, other testing, um, you, you correlated that with not just venous thromboses, but also arterial thromboses. And I, I was surprised that they were almost equal in, in numbers. Yes, but remember that everything is multifactorial. So for arterial thrombosis, things like hypertension and other traditional risk factors play a role. So it's not just antiphospholipid antibodies. Yeah. So the point of the first paper was that lupus anticoagulant is by itself is just as good. And the second paper said head to head lupus anticoagulant versus double positivity, triple positivity, still lupus anticoagulant still works. What in reality do you do and what do you hinge your decisions or thoughts on? Not necessarily decisions, but you're always doing this as a risk profiling sort of measure. So my belief backed up by our data is that if someone has lupus anticoagulant, even just 25% of their visits, they deserve prophylactic therapy. And right now, based on the evidence, the best prophylactic therapy is a baby aspirin plus hydroxychloroquine. Did you want to make a case for beta-2 glycoprotein? Well, yes, but you know what's controversial is that we measure IgA. And in Europe, where they uh, first, uh, Dr. Pengo, coined the term triple positivity, he was looking at just IgG and IgM. But in our lupus patients, IgA anti-beta-2 might add risk on top of the lupus anticoagulant. So it is worth measuring that isotype and paying attention to it. So for the audience, I want to give some perspective. The, um, I believe that having lupus anticoagulant um, had a, a, gave you a twofold or no, sorry, a threefold increased risk for arterial thromboses and almost a fivefold increased risk for venous thromboses. And then the beta two was around two or something like that. Am I close on those numbers? Yes. And so, you know, we're not talking, you know, uh, risk factors of, of 20 or 30, but we're right. talking a, quite a significant increased risk that is clinically meaningful. Well, and I found this, uh, these reports of yours very interesting, especially in light of another one that you had that looked at lupus patients and their risk of MI versus CVA, and that the risk factors for them are not the same. Yes. And I think there are a couple important messages the first is that strokes really peak in the first couple of years. So I think we used to think that there was this bimodal pattern and all the bad cardiovascular stuff came later. Well, that's not true. Strokes definitely peak early. And the other important message is that the lupus anticoagulant and low C3, those are really risk factors for stroke, much more so than they are risk factors for myocardial infarction. And I, that really surprised me because I, I think of sort of, you know, immune activation and other factors 
being more important in the coronary arteries. But that's the whole reason we do cohort studies is you're not supposed to guess, we're supposed to base everything on evidence. Now we have that evidence. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting observation. I think many people would probably think about that as maybe what they've seen. I mean, uh, uh, MI is, uh, has, in my experience, been a later phenomenon, age-related, comorbidity-related, and, and obviously lupus activity. Can't, I, w- I always thought played some role, but I'm not surprised to see that um, it doesn't play maybe that big a role, um, that there are other, other factors that go into MI uh, in lupus patients later on. Now, the other thing that I think is going to surprise people, especially everybody who listened to the plenary session on the Georgia Lupus Registry, is at Hopkins, we do not find African Americans having a higher risk of these events than Caucasians. In our data set, the two ethnicities are superimposable, but they have different risk factors. Mm -hmm. So they get to the same frequency of events, but they get there in different ways. So antiphospholipid antibody is much more common in Caucasians than in African Americans. And some things are just such a shock. If we look at risk factors for myocardial infarction, for example, hypertension is not significant in African-Americans. I'm thinking, you know, how is that even possible? But again, you know, uh, I learned a long time ago, uh, let the data speak. (laughs) Well, um, complex, yes, but certainly manageable. We want want to thank you for your time, Michelle. Um, As always, you inform us so well. Thank you, Jack.